was a boy, I used to believe my parents and believe my teachers and how, that you should have respect for your elders and betters and that the men upstairs knew what they were doing. And I was taught that the more I would know, the further I would go. So I stayed in school, I got a degree, eventually got a teaching certificate, I went out to teach. And the first school I taught in, the principal was primarily concerned that the children did not step on the rose beds. And uh, education seemed to be the furthest thing from his mind. I saw teachers and administrators that uh, seemed incompetent, and I started to question some of these ideas I had. And as I looked around me, I saw a sign on the door that said, Emergency Exit, Authorized Personnel Only. I wondered who'd written that. But then uh, later I saw another sign that said emergency exit not to be used under any circumstances. I went to a library looking for a book and I noticed that all the books on pregnancy were stored on a shelf down by the floor. Probably the people that needed them most couldn't even see them. And then as I looked around, I saw that very often competent people, the competent individual, was promoted to something he couldn't do. I saw a competent mechanic where he used to take my car. He was terrific. He was very responsible, very precise, knew exactly what he was doing, so they made him foreman. Now he's no longer fixing cars and he's trying to manage other, the other mechanics. And he's very incompetent. He doesn't do this well. He's really a competent mechanic and an incompetent foreman. I also observed that a competent salesman, a man who was just terrific at dealing with people, with a great personality, very popular, well-liked, good at selling, personally, uh, his sales were so good that uh, they made him sales manager. And in this position, he'd found his level of incompetence because he was atrocious at the paperwork, at uh, atrocious at designing the uh, territories for his salesmen. In other words, he was not good at dealing through other people or organizing other people. I saw competent uh, engineers getting promoted to supervisory positions. They were great at dealing with things and incompetent at dealing with people. And over and over again, I saw this this phenomenon, and I called it the Peter Principle. The Peter Principle states very simply that in any hierarchy, an employee tends to rise to his level of incompetence, and that's where he stays. You see, in any organization where competence is essentially eligibility for promotion, and incompetence is a bar to promotion, wherever those rules apply, people will rise to their level of incompetence and tend to stay there. I was a teacher for, and in education for 30 years, and I kept seeing this phenomenon over and over again. The competent student in a university who's very good at uh, consuming knowledge and passing exams and being punctual and doing all of the things right, would get a certificate and to become a teacher. And being a good consumer of knowledge didn't necessarily make them a good dispenser of knowledge. So frequently, the good scholar graduated to become the incompetent teacher. And then, within the system, the competent teacher is eligible for promotion to become a senior science master or head of the science department. And the competent teacher, who'd been a competent scholar, a competent teacher, may be incompetent as a department head. Here, the teacher had to order supplies for other teachers and organize timetables and, and be very good at dealing with his own class, but not good at helping other people. And so here is a department head. The senior, senior science master has reached his level of incompetence. At the top of this hierarchy, I saw the headmaster, who frequently was a very competent teacher. But when he came to this position of manager of this school, now had to deal with the public, with parents, with 
community organizations, with senior educational officials, and solve problems of teachers. And so, as a manager, he found his level of incompetence. And there he'll remain until he retires, or death, or something uh, removes him from this position. So we see that in an organization, people tend, as long as they're competent, they rise. None of these three examples are evil people. Each was trying to do his job and was dedicated and honest. And, and so the system promoted them to, from what they could do to something they couldn't do. The individual often will be successful, feel happy, and then he gets to a position which I call his level of incompetence, in which he's frustrated. He's no longer getting the satisfaction. He knows somehow that he isn't doing the job too well. And th this is where stress diseases start to uh, show up. This is where the person starts to uh, develop tension, become bad-tempered, start blaming other people, develop ulcers, develop high blood pressure, develop, uh, become an alcoholic, and so on. So the individual may suffer all kinds of syndromes that are related specifically to his pr last promotion. And one of the biggest problems in the United States, the problem that most psychiatrists are dealing with today, uh, is a problem called the identity crisis, where people have lost themselves in the hierarchy. They've done what they've been told. They're following the rules. They're being promoted. And then, all of a sudden, they find themselves wondering, what am I? Who am I? Where am I? But mainly, who am I? And they're, they're lost in the process, the process of being promoted and trying to conform to what the hierarchy expects. And they've lost their own identity. This is a major problem. <laughs> The social implications are very significant. When a person reaches his level of incompetence, he bungles his job, frustrates his co-workers, and erodes the efficiency of the organization. So that has social significance for the organization. When you go to City Hall, you go and ask for help, and the information officer says, we don't give out that information. You have to go to room 425 and ask for a form 6B. And you get the form. You fill it in, and they tell you to go to room 225. You take it to room 225, and they say, this form is obsolete. We now have a new form, and so on. Th this kind of thing, when you as a customer buy an appliance, and, and it's got a warranty, and you try to get it repaired or replaced, when you as a citizen, try to get service from your government, the implications become very obvious. There are a number of ways that uh, a boss or an employer can reduce the promotion of incompetence. Uh, some of the techniques are essentially trial promotions. There are many ways of, of trying out a man in a job without giving him a promotion. For example, in uh, one trial promotion, the man appeared to be the best prospect. They gave him a trial promotion for three weeks, just asked him, would you temporarily manage this department? And within a few days, he's complaining about everyone. He's complaining about his subordinates. He's spending a great deal of time talking to top management about his worries, his problems, and so on. Instead, of, when they discuss with him the satisfactions he's getting out of being manager, he's talking about the complaints of being manager. Now, you have pretty good evidence that if that man was in the job for two years, he would not be satisfied. He'd be, get, he'd be complaining. Those are the kinds of, of 
things that you find out in a trial. You don't find out a man's total ability. Another kind of uh, trial promotion, in a way, is simulation. Simulation is used a great deal, uh, but you can use it in promotion. For example, if I'm handed some sample correspondence and said, look, Peter, would you try and answer those letters? We've got a lot of those letters. Uh, and see how I would respond to that, making decisions that I would have to make in that higher position. This would be another way. It's a simulation. I'm not actually given the job, but I'm given some of these letters. Maybe my answers will not be used, but it does give me a chance to see how I would respond to those kinds of problems. The employee can use some of the same kinds of things only from the other side of the desk. An employee can very often find opportunities to try out a job, try out some parts of a job before he takes them. And uh, there are many ways this can be done. He can uh, ask if he could do some of this. He can see the opportunity uh, when uh, somebody else is ill and say, could I try some of this or could I? He can ask. Also, he can simulate in his own mind. If I, if I take this promotion, do I really want to have to buy a, a black tie, dress suit? Do I really want to enjoy, join the country club? Do I really want to give up the kind of social life I have now? He can, he can think and in his own mind, put himself in that position mentally and look around and see, how would I be? How would I feel in the, these situations? The tendency is for him to say, I could do his job. I, I'm as smart as he is. I'm as common as he is. Therefore, you know, given the opportunity, I should take that job. But if he puts himself mentally into that position and looks around and says, what would I have to do? What would my life be like? He can often find out a great deal. He also can ask people, ask people in those positions what it's like, what he has to do. What are the pressures? What are the conflicts in this higher office? The conflicts now, I think I have conflicts here, but if I move up, I now have to satisfy customers, employees, and the board of directors. I have to make a profit. I have to try and make a competitive product, and I have to deal with unions. Now I have a conflict of interest. Can I accommodate this kind of conflict without tearing me apart, without me feeling terribly frustrated? If I can't, if I can't accommodate that kind of conflict, maybe I better stay where I am. If this wouldn't bother me, okay, take the promotion. The question of more money and the better standard of living is one that, again, has to be answered in terms of the hierarchy you're in. If you don't have enough money for the essentials of life, obviously more money is the solution. But if you have the essentials of life, if you are able to do many of the things you want to do, more money can't improve the quality of your life. Sure, you can have the second car, you can do the crazy things that a lot of Americans do, accumulate tremendous quantities of material possessions that they don't even use. That's going beyond. That money is really useless money, contributing often to the individual becoming less himself, because now the possessions start to own him. He has to be concerned about that house in the country and who's taking care of it, or the yacht in the harbor, and all of these things. And so he has all these possessions, and he ha now he has to have people to take care of them. These possessions are controlling him, unless he's really using these possessions, unless he's really enjoying them and participating with them, they become useless artifacts in his life that often control him, and man becomes the tools of the machines he owns and the possessions he owns. So I think the question of money is the same as everything else. Money 
beyond a certain amount does not produce happiness. <laughs> What rewards a person or motivates them is very, very complex in that it starts very early in life. The child uh, learns to walk, he gets every, the family's happy, he learns to feed himself, he becomes toilet trained. They shower affection on him, often things, give him rewards and food and say, uh, treats and sweets and say, great, He's, you're a good boy, Johnny. He goes to school, he, he sits in his seat, teacher says, you're a good boy, Johnny. He learns to read, he passes from grade to grade. All of these things are rewarded all throughout life. You go and get a job, you do a good job, you get a promotion, you get a raise in pay. This is rewarded. So this is built into us, into our nervous system by our whole upbringing. Right from the beginning, at mother's breast, the infant is loved and cuddled and rewarded. When the infant behaves well, it gets patted, it gets loved. And this goes right up to the symbolic kinds of rewards, like a paycheck, a bigger office, a name on, your name on the door, your name in a brass plate, thicker carpets, all kinds of rewards all the way along. And so it's natural that we would keep on moving up as far as we can go. And unfortunately, that's a trap that that kind of upbringing that we have gets us into. We get into this trap of thinking that escalation, that climbing will always pay off. And it doesn't always pay off. <laughs> I think I'd like to make it clear that I'm not saying people shouldn't accept promotions. Some people should. Some people enjoy power, enjoy authority, enjoy responsibility, and others find it a burden. It drags them down. It makes them feel that they're responsible for more than they should be. Any, any boss, manager, or chief executive who spends a lot of time reminiscing about the good old days, complaining about the quality of his employees, complaining that the competition is too strong and so on, is not really enjoying the challenge of that job. <laughs> first thing I would say, as specific advice within that kind of situation we find ourselves, is to really examine what it is that I get the most enjoyment out of. Is it my home life? Is it my family? Is it making love? Is it painting pictures? Is it, is it in my job? Is it in the idea of selling more by, or, or expanding my department? Or am I satisfied? Can I get my satisfactions outside of the hierarchy? Is that more important to me? The quality of my total life experience. These are the kinds of things you have to, have to analyze if you're going to avoid the pitfalls of, of our kind of society, our kind of hierarchy, which keeps saying up is better, more is better, get out there and get yours, climb that ladder. If we do that, there are a number of things you can do as an individual. Uh, and these are not impractical. These are things that have been tried out, and, and I have lots of feedback on it from people who've done. Such simple things as writing a list. What are the things that, that have really produced satisfying feelings? When I think about my life, what are the things that really make me feel that I, my life has been worthwhile? And very often, the individual will find that there are things that are available to them. Uh, available to them now. For instance, uh, a man told me, 
This was a, a middle-aged man, a family. He was vice president of a successful company. He was offered a chance to become president of a new division. And he was already thinking, oh boy, this is my chance. And he was reading the Peter Principle, and he, he was laughing at it. And he was thinking, of, and then all of a sudden, he realized that this book was like a mirror to him. He started to see himself. And he said, what do I really want in life? What, what really is important? And he found that the promotion, as he looked at it from that point of view, would not be what he wanted. He, d he knew he didn't have that many more years to work. Did he want to spend them in striving for this, or did he want to spend them with his family? Because he, when he really looked at it, he was really a family man. The things he enjoyed the most were the, the picnics he went on with his family, the tr trips they'd had together, the times they'd had together at home uh, with the family barbecue, his own hobby of painting pictures. If he'd taken this promotion, it'd taken him away from that. For him, at that stage in his life, at that position financially, he would not have improved his life by taking a promotion. And he made that decision rationally. And this is where the question, the big question about the Peter Principle arises. Should we go throughout life being conditioned to keep on accepting that next reward, to keep on running like a squirrel in a cage, to keep on striving for that carrot on the stick? Or should we use our ability to be rational and think about where am I going? What is the purpose of my life? Is reward through promotion the reward for me? Or are there other rewards through other aspects of living? This is the question. I can't answer for you. I try to answer it for myself. Each individual can use his ability, his rational ability, to analyze the situation. This is where the Peter Principle, written as humor, as satire, to help people laugh at the problem, can actually help people make some of these very important decisions in their own lives. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.